Hello, and welcome to our graduates and to all of their family and friends who join us here virtually for St. Louis University's 2021 commencement ceremony. My name is Donna Bess Myers, and I serve as Interim Associate Vice President and Dean of Students. To begin our program, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Donald Lindhorst, a professor in the School of Public Health and Social Justice for 24 years. Dr. Lindhorst has also served as Director of the School of Social Work, as well as Interim Dean of the College in Education and Public Service and the College of Public Health and Social Justice. Dr. Lindhorst is also a committed instructor of courses in the Master of Social Work program, the Bachelor of Social Work program, and the Bachelor of Criminology and Criminal Justice program. Today's program will include remarks from President Postello, Provost Lewis, a student speaker, and our commencement speaker, Dr. Alexander Garza. You will also hear from your college and school deans. I am honored to celebrate this special day with you. Everything that got you here, hard work, talent, drive, early mornings, late nights, and weekends have paid off. Whatever you do, never stop learning, exploring, growing, and challenging yourself to be your best. Throughout your journey at SLU, there were faculty and staff who helped you along the way, and I encourage you to reach out and thank those who impacted you. At all St. Louis University events, it is our SLU tradition to call upon God to watch over and bless us all. I would now like to invite Dr. Michael Jones, youth pastor at Friendly Temple Missionary Baptist Church, to offer our invocation. Greetings. My name is Michael Jones, proud graduate of St. Louis University Arts and Science class of 2010 and School of Education class of 2012 and 2016. Let us pray. Gracious God, a God who rules, sustains, and fills the world with all of its beauty, we rejoice today and simply pause for the cause to give thanks. Words cannot adequately describe all that you have done for us on our behalf. And if I could, for just one moment, recall the religious expression of the Black church tradition and say, simply put, if I had 10,000 tongues, I would still not adequately be able to thank you for all that you have done. Today, O oh God, our prayer is that you preserve the class of 2021, that you surround them with your loving care and everlasting mercy, that you protect them from dangers both seen and unseen, that you confirm and affirm their educational experiences at St. Louis University that has prepared them to go out into the world that struggles to promote justice, equality, and truth. That in the Ignatian way of being men and women for others, that it galvanizes and inspires our students' daily lives and interactions. And oh God, it would be an act of negligence and irresponsibility if we were not to acknowledge all those who have supported all those who have sacrificed and all those who have sustained the class of 2021 to make it to this joyous occasion today. We thank them for you, O oh God, to the parents, to the grandparents, to the partners, to the children, to all of the family who have supported our graduates of the class of 2021. And O oh God, we pray this prayer to the God of the great universe who is known by many names. Let every heart who agrees, say amen. Congratulations to the class of 2021. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Now it is time for St. Louis University's varsity song by our master singers. This song was composed more than 100 years ago and was performed as the university's alma mater at commencements until sometime in the 1960s. In 2018, we revived it and it has quickly become a new slew tradition. Heirs of a royal name, dear varsity, for thy our faith and love we pledge to thee. Guardians of truth and light we always knew, thou whom the years have crowned, saying through is you. Oh, 
song. Proudly our colors fly, gray, white, and blue. The leather chorus was sing blue is you. Great is thy noble heart, tender and true. Show us thy loyalty, saint blue is you. Thank you to our master singers for that wonderful performance. It is now my privilege to introduce the president of St. Louis University. Dr. Pastello became the university's 33rd president in July of 2014. He is the first permanent lay president in SLU's 203-year history. Under his leadership, the university has come together as a community to develop and advance a campus-wide strategic plan and vision for our future. At the heart of this plan is the success of our students and the health of our patients, rooted in our Catholic Jesuit mission and values. Dr. Pastello is leading SLU's Accelerating Excellence campaign, the largest fundraising campaign in university history. The campaign has already set multiple university records for annual gift totals and is on course to reach the $500 million goal. Community engagement is a central tenet of Dr. Pastello's leadership. The university has responded by elevating our involvement in the St. Louis region and is working as a partner to bring people together and address the region's most pressing issues. Please welcome the president of St. Louis University, Dr. Fred Pastello. My dear December 2020 and May 2021 graduates, it is a blessing and an honor to be with you and your loved ones today for this special virtual opportunity to celebrate your achievements. The past 14 months have been like no other in modern day higher education. All of you have had to adjust to all of it, including a virtual commencement. Some of you face serious personal challenges during your time here. Others may have struggled at points to make it through your academic program. But we are all here together now. You made it. Congratulations. To the parents, family, friends, and other supporters watching virtually, we are delighted to share this momentous occasion with you. Graduates, please take a moment to acknowledge and thank your loved ones, those who have supported and sustained you, nurtured and loved you. I hope that in these days that follow, you will make the time to reach out to our faculty and staff who have stretched your minds, sharpened your skills, and fostered your development. I assure you that they will miss you as much as you will miss them. During the celebratory moment, we count our many blessings. We are also called to mourn those who lost their lives to COVID-19 and other causes. These are loved ones 
neighbors, friends, and colleagues. In remembrance of those in our hearts and all those who have gone before us and not able to share in this celebration, let us pause for a moment of silence. Thank you. When you chose SLU, you had a sense that it would be a good fit for you. You entered with an academic profile that placed you in the top 10% of students in the country. Many of you, like me, were the first in your family to attend college. Regardless of your path, I am confident that you realize here at SLU, ethics and morals inform action. Each person is valued and integrity is vital. We dare to choose courage over comfort and justice over indifference. You know well that there are three core parts of our SLU identity. We are Catholic, Jesuit, University. As a Catholic institution, our mission reflects our extraordinary vocation. We are responsible for cultivating a community of wholeness. As a Jesuit institution, we ask, knowledge for what? In our work at the frontiers of culture and the margins of society, the lines of service and scholarship are blurred. Our research is grounded in our involvement in the world and refined through scholarly debate. As a university, the complexities of society are laboratories for thought and experimentation. We rigorously pursue knowledge and pass that knowledge on to each generation. And at the intersection of academic excellence and compassionate healthcare is our delivery of informed medicine. If we have done our job, and I know we have, you leave SLU with more questions than you entered. And as you move forward, others will undoubtedly ask questions of you. I am confident that one of those questions will be, what is a Billiken? The Billiken's appearance may be difficult to describe, but you know one when you see one. It is captured in the feeling of being one sloop. The Billiken looks like our quest for understanding our shared humanity, to fill our unquenchable thirst for truth and our desire to explore life's vital questions. The Billiken looks like an engaged citizen, one that compassionately seeks common ground. The Billiken looks like a faith that does justice and upholds human dignity. The Billiken looks like authenticity, showing up, being seen, and seeing others. Graduates, as I describe our mascot, it is clear that the Billiken looks like all of us and acts like all of you. As Billikens, you symbolize the hope that it is possible to make the world the way it ought to be. Your generation has more knowledge more data, and more tools at your disposal than any other generation in history. Do not succumb to negative assertions that may be made about your generation. They are wrong. I have seen the depths of your work ethic and the breadth of your compassion. You are fierce advocates for inclusion. The things you do and the words you use are important. You leave the SLU arches academically gifted, research-oriented, empathetic, and culturally aware. You enter a world that needs daring leadership and contemplative action. You are prepared to share joy with those who are low, direction with those who are lost, and hope with those who live in fear. In his Holy Week message, his Holiness Pope Francis said that what we need today is the creativity of love. I pray that your love and Billiken pride reverberate throughout the communities in which you will serve for decades to come. 
Remember that you will always have a home at SLU and will forever share in the abundant resources of each other and your alma mater. SLU is not just the university you went to, it is the place you go from. Wherever your path takes you, lead with love and mercy. Make things the way they ought to be. And what ask what Abilican looks like, show them. I wish you Godspeed. Thank you, Dr. Pastello. It is now my honor to introduce the university's provost, Dr. Michael Lewis, to provide remarks. Dr. Lewis was named the university's provost in February 2021. What a fitting way to end the 2020-2021 academic year, talking to a camera. Having to imagine there are people listening to me, wondering if they'll be amused by the beginning to my graduation remarks. My name is Mike Lewis, and I am the university's provost. It is a pleasure to be with you today, virtually. I'm not going to lie. I really wish we were in person. While I am excited we get to have our pre-commencement ceremonies in person this year, albeit in a reduced capacity, I really wish I could look out over a packed crowd of graduates and their families at Chaffetz Arena and celebrate with you in person. I feel like we're getting close to being able to return to the normal, human, in-person interactions we all crave. Today, for the university's commencement, it still needs to be like this, virtually. I'm thrilled to be able to share a few comments with you, our graduates, celebrating your accomplishments and relaying my hopes for you. Our undergraduates came to us four years ago, or perhaps you were like me and you enjoyed the undergraduate experience so much that you took a little longer. Our undergraduate, graduate, and professional students came to us from a broad diversity of backgrounds. You picked majors and areas of study. Some of you changed your minds and you went in different directions. You all had your own path to this day, but I hope there is a common thread that you experienced and that you take with you on your path as it extends beyond graduation, our Catholic Jesuit mission. Regardless your major, or if you're graduating with a graduate professional degree, or if you're an undergrad continuing on to a professional or pro graduate program, or whether you plan to enter the workforce, your education at St. Louis University was a formation so you can make the world a better place. Your SLU education calls you to see your way to God through regular discernment. It calls you to be women and men with and for others. In particular, it calls you to be with the marginalized, those who are excluded from society, those whose dignity has been denied. I hope this remains a constant in your life. I bring up our mission because I think it is central to your personal successes and a fulfilling life. I noted that as a graduating class, some of you took different amounts of time to get here. Some of you changed your minds along the way. Here's the thing, this is not odd. In fact, it is quite normal. At some point, the plans we make no longer make sense and life takes us in a different direction. As you go through life and experience the various paths ahead, I hope the Jesuit mission you experienced in your SLU education is grounding for you. I alluded to the fact that I took five years for my undergraduate degree. It wasn't that I changed my mind that extended my stay, more that I couldn't make up my mind. I liked chemistry and I liked anthropology. So I majored in both and that took more than four years. I ultimately had to choose when the capstone course for each program was offered at the same time in my fifth year. I was then certain that I was going to the University of Calgary for graduate school. Then I went to the University of Missouri. I was sure I would return home to Canada after my graduate studies until I met my wife and I stayed in the US. When I took a job as a chemistry professor here at SLU back in 2004, I knew I would remain a faculty member teaching and doing research in organic chemistry for my entire career. Here I am. I don't teach, I don't do research anymore. I really like my current job. Lots of plans, many paths I was certain I would follow, until I didn't. I left out a lot of details, a lot of change in my journey, but you get the picture. About half of my journey from undergraduate to graduate to now happened at SLU, and the Jesuit mission resonated with me deeply and immediately. It encourages us to define our work away from ourselves and toward others. My jobs have changed, 
My interests have changed. My aspirations have changed. But the constant is the desire to use my talents to help others and help those who are marginalized. As you navigate the changes you will ultimately face in your life, I hope the Jesuit mission you lived at SLU remains a constant. Let me wrap up by coming back to the fact that I am doing this in front of a camera, virtually. This last year, 15 months or so, has been challenging. For our undergraduates, the last half of the spring semester of your junior year and your entire senior year have been significantly impacted by a global pandemic. For our graduate students, your research and scholarship was dramatically disrupted. You couldn't get into your labs. Visit museums and libraries required for your scholarship. Our professional students had to overcome the challenges the pandemic created for practical experiences. You have all experienced and overcome challenges that no previous classes had to overcome. It is truly incredible. And yet you are here, graduating from St. Louis University. This is an amazing achievement. You learned to learn online. You learned to follow public health guidelines to keep us all safe. You learned resiliency. I'm sure this has been exhausting. I hope you look back at this time sometime soon and celebrate the incredible accomplishment of completing your studies and graduating during a pandemic. I would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge the incredible work of our faculty and staff in making this day possible for our graduates. The past year has been incredibly challenging for them too. Our faculty pivoted their teaching to online. They taught courses with students face-to-face -face and online simultaneously. Our staff kept our students and campus safe, transforming our campus into a space that aligned with public health requirements. Our staff, faculty, and students tested for COVID. They led contact tracing. They administered vaccines. Our Vaccine Institute actually helped develop the Moderna vaccine. I could go on. I know so many are exhausted by this pandemic year. Thank you all so much for all that you have done and all that you have given of yourself. So to our graduates, we are so proud of you. You earned your degrees through the most trying of conditions. Congratulations and the very best of wishes for all that life has in store for you. Our impressive graduates have been taught by an impressive faculty. They have seen our graduates through years of classes, papers, labs, projects, and final exams. The formative partnership between faculty and students lies at the heart of the academic enterprise. All faculty are by turns, transmitters of knowledge, purveyors of culture, initiators of professional training, mentors, role models, confidants, and in some cases, research colleagues of our students. The faculty revel in learning, both their students' learning and their own, and they are committed to intellectual and personal development. We recognize the many key roles that our faculty play in helping SLU graduates to develop both educationally and as whole persons capable of making a difference in the world. And it is very fitting to acknowledge the faculty's efforts, especially during the past year, at this commencement. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Now it's my pleasure to introduce a speaker from the graduating class. Jory Brewer is graduating from our Doisy College of Health Sciences. From Romeoville, Illinois, located in the Chicagoland area, Jory is a fourth year occupational therapy student. She is a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated Beta Delta Chapter and has served in the role of peer mentor and resident advisor for the Department of Housing and Residence Life during her time here on campus. Jory has had the privilege of being president of the Black Student Alliance, as well as being inducted into the Pi Theta Epsilon, the Occupational Therapy Honor Society, and has warmed the hearts of new families and students as a SLU 101 leader. This fall, Jory will be continuing her education in St. Louis University's Master of Occupational Therapy program. Hello and welcome. Thank you for the beautiful introduction, Donna Bess Myers. I am honored to be standing in front of you today, greeting the newly graduated class of 2021. How is it that four years ago, we were freshmen trying to navigate our way down West Pine and forgetting our banner ID numbers whenever anyone asked? How is it that four years ago, we were hugging our loved ones goodbye and hanging pictures with command strips that never come off as easy as the instructions say on the walls of our dorms? Those young and shy freshmen are now you. You have done the thing that every little kid dreams of. 
you have submitted the applications, driven miles away from home to tour colleges, and the hardest of all, decided on a major and stuck with it. Today, you are a graduate of this university and fully equipped to explain to any person what the heck a Billiken is. I can tell you that this journey has not been an easy one and we have endured more than the average student. During the summer of 2020, our world was faced with two pandemics, COVID-19 and the killing of innocent black people such as George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Elijah McClain to name a few. I thought to myself, how are we supposed to go back to school when everyone and everything around us seems to be falling apart? It would take a community of people to make this school year seem anywhere close to normal. As I gathered my bags to come back, I was nervous, but I remembered what it meant to be a SLU student. As a Jesuit university, SLU has impacted the way I view the world. We are taught that in order to be an active member of society, you must seek to create change outside of yourself. During my sophomore year of college, I had the opportunity to study abroad in Bologna, Italy. It seemed as though no matter where I went, those Jesuit values had been ingrained in me and tattooed on my heart forever. This idea of magis or more encouraged me to dig deeper and learn about where and who I was living with. Every Wednesday, I attended a group called Arte Immigrante for Italian immigrants who were looking to fellowship and build relationships with one another. It was here that I found peace and joy after a long day of classes. I fell in love with the program and it was the one thing I knew would bring a smile to my face. After returning to the States, I felt as though I had been given the opportunity of a lifetime and was thrilled to share my experiences with my fellow classmates, as every student who goes abroad is. When I reflect back on my four years at this institution, I would like to give thanks to those who made it possible to keep this place running. I can count on my fingers and toes how many times I have been hugged or greeted with a sweet smile by our dining staff. Not only do they make sure we are fed, but that our souls are well nourished. Our custodial staff members work tirelessly to ensure that we have a space to be proud of and can call our own. As for my loved ones and dearest friends, thank you. Thank you for encouraging me to continue on when I felt like giving up. To my parents, Angela and D'Angelo, I love you very much and I'm honored to be your daughter. I cannot wait to continue to make you proud in all that I do. To my friends who have held my hand and forced me to do things I never thought I'd do, like travel the world or drive 16 plus hours to Destin, I love you. The class of 2021, we made it. I cannot wait to see the wonderful things you will do and the places you will go. Remember, I will always be there to support you. Though your loved ones may not have been able to attend graduation, know that they are sending you love from afar. Thank you. Thank you, Jory. Now it is my privilege to introduce Mr. Joseph Conran, the Chairman of Board of Trustees, to introduce our commencement speaker and honorary degree recipients. Thank you, Donna. Good afternoon to the new graduates of St. Louis University. You are why we're celebrating virtually today, and I am honored to be part of your special day. I am here to introduce your commencement speaker, Dr. Alexander Garza. Those from the St. Louis area probably know Dr. Garza from his COVID-19 updates to the community and is serving as an incident commander for the St. Louis Metropolitan Pandemic Task Force. The task force is comprised of the major healthcare providers in the St. Louis metropolitan area that join together to combat COVID-19. He is also a St. Louis University alumnus earning his master's degree in public health in 2003. Before joining SSM Health in September 2016, Dr. Garza worked at St. Louis University, where he served as Associate Dean for Public Health Practice and Associate Professor of Epidemiology at the College of Public Health and Social Justice 
as well as Associate Professor in Emergency Medicine at the School of Medicine. Previously, Dr. Garza served as Assistant Secretary and Chief Medical Officer to the United States Department of Homeland Security. Dr. Garza began his career in health as an EMT in 1986 and has worked at every level of providing care and leadership in emergency medicine and healthcare. He has worked as a paramedic and a flight medic and is a board certified emergency physician. He is also a colonel in the United States Army Reserves and a veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom. He has researched, written, and lectured extensively on issues involving EMS, health security preparedness, and the impact of social determinations of health on disasters. Dr. Garza has received numerous awards for his military service and his civilian career, including the Bronze Star and Combat Action Badge. Class of 2021, it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Alexander Garza. Thank you, Mr. Conrad. President Pistello, Board of Trustees, faculty, family, and friends, but most of all, to the graduating class of St. Louis University 2021. I am both honored and humbled to give this commencement address. And what a memorable class this is, not only succeeding spectacularly in the classroom and in the community, but also under this dark cloud of coronavirus infectious disease 2019, also called COVID-19, also called ruiner of my life. By the way, in case someone asks you, there are no COVID-1 through 18. Something you should know if you ever find yourself working for the leader of the free world. Just saying. So in trying to write this commencement address, I did what any normal person would do. I sat and I thought, what words could I possibly say to inspire and to motivate? And I thought some more, and then it began to rain. And suddenly it came to me like the sun coming up over the horizon. And it was at that moment that I opened my laptop and began to type these words, best commencement addresses ever enter. And boom, top 10 commencement addresses ever appeared. Now I'm not sure who judges such things, but since it was on the internet, obviously it had to be true. But I noticed this weird pattern. There were a bunch of Ivy League colleges like Steve Jobs at Stanford and Conan O'Brien at Dartmouth and J.K. Rowling at Harvard and mixed in with Will Ferrell at USC and Jim Carrey at Maharishi University of Management. True, and he killed it, really. After you watch this, go and watch that. And as I watched these fantastic commencement addresses, I was in awe of their speechwriters. But then, but then I saw this pattern emerge, this common thread, this thing that brought them all together. There were people there. Not only that, they were laughing and telling jokes, and not only that, they were hugging and nodding, and their heads were bobbing and they were clapping. I know, it's crazy, right? Their biggest worries were how to both be funny yet serious all within 20 minutes. Now just think of your past four years and how it ended up in your final year. There was an assault on the nation's capital, a second impeachment of a president, never happened before. A battle for the nation's soul because of systemic racism and a worldwide deadly pandemic. Man, you guys crushed it. So let's just call it out. This is weird and it's not fair. It's weird me talking into a camera, trying to inspire you before you're released into the wild. And it's weird and not fair, not being able to walk across the stage and be handed a piece of paper that says, you will not get the real thing until once your final check clears. And it's weird and not fair that all of us aren't gathered together in Chaffetz Arena, clapping and yelling and doing our best Ric Flair, woo, shoulder to shoulder, breathing and breathing and breathing so very close to each other. Maybe that isn't such a good idea either. Let me talk to Fred. I, I know he's around here somewhere. He was here just a minute ago. 
Uh, but seriously, who could have predicted this, this, this pandemic? I mean, besides evolutionary biologists and infectious disease experts, but besides them, who could have predicted this? Well, okay, there was Scott C. Burns, the guy who wrote Contagion, kind of wrote the storyline, but who else could have known that this simple piece of ribose nucleic acid, that's called RNA for you non-science majors, in a certain sequence in all of the most basic life forms of virus, in fact, many people are not even sure if it should be considered a form of life. Yes, this tiny piece of nucleic acid came together in a certain sequence and did something that man could not do. Not that man hasn't been trying and continues to try to do through centuries of politics and war and economic pressures and discrimination and pollution and global warming, this tiny microscopic piece of protein align just right, without fancy computers, without superconductors or jet engines, or nuclear enrichment or money, or a TikTok account, whatever that is, or a degree from SLU, brought the world to a standstill. It brought such death and destruction across the globe, which continues to do to this day. And we pray for our friends, especially in India. May God bring them peace. Three lessons from this. First, Respect Mother Nature. Do it. Do it now before it's too late. These things happen for reasons, so respect nature and Mother Earth before something really, really bad happens. Second, be nice to nerds because they are the ones that are going to ride to the rescue and save your butt when you don't do number one. And lastly, I hate to break this to you, especially because I'm supposed to be inspiring you, but I've spent the last 16 months trying to keep it real, or as my fans on social media call it, fear porn. Not even sure what that means, but life is sometimes not fair. And we should not expect random things to be fair. Yes, this past year has been one of the most memorable and challenging and scary and depressing in the entire history of the world. The pandemic has been disorienting for the entire world and for you and for me, and, and sometimes I'm not sure how to think of it. I've been the visible head of the St. Louis Metropolitan Pandemic Task Force for over a year now. I've done hundreds of press briefings talking about admissions and hospitalizations and ICU status and vaccine and masks, and it's a paradox. On one hand, it's extremely rewarding as a physician and as someone who values public health. How could it not be? Working on a cause that matters, not in an abstract way, but in a very real and personal way, knowing that lives would be affected and that lives would be lost if we did not act and act boldly. Advocating course of action is easy to see when lives are in the balance, and it doesn't take a huge amount of courage to act when you understand what will happen if you do not. However, I also recognize that this comes at a tremendous cost. I think about the tragedy this pandemic has brought, not just on the persons that got COVID-19, but on their families, the nurses, the doctors, the therapists, the janitorial staff, food service, the chaplains, everyone else who came to work every day in the dark hours to take care of the sick, to hold their hands, to anoint the dying, to talk to the bereaved. I also think of the businesses that were shuttered, the dreams that were lost, the isolation of our elderly, the lack of social interaction for our children. No one was spared and everyone suffered to varying degrees. Our black and brown brothers and sisters, more than most, through no fault of their own. I am also cognizant that I would not be speaking at your commencement, being honored were it not for this terrible disease. So it is with some humility and I will admit some degree of guilt that I accepted this honor, for it is only because of a deadly pandemic that I am even here. Now, if you've listened to my press briefings, and I'll just assume that you all did, then you know that I often compare the pandemic to a war on the virus, and there are eerie similarities. Now, while I was preparing to go to war in Iraq, my good friend, Major Bill Burke, told me, you will see people's true selves once we get into country. And by that, he meant people show who they really are when they're under stress. 
and I came to understand the depths of alcoholism on a soldier watching him live in a Muslim country. And we saw the same thing for better or for worse, for good or for bad, over the course of the year of the pandemic. The virus had a distinct advantage because it did not act rationally. It had no political agenda. It didn't care about conservative or liberal, black or white, rich or poor. It only wanted to replicate. And it was very, very good at this. But even with all the acrimony and political theater, with all the mispronunciation of names, I believe there is still a valuable lesson to be learned and treasured. And so, in addition to cursing the previous year for all that is taken from us, let us also exploit it. Exploit it for the good that it has given to us. That our families are kind of nice to be around. That we can and we should make individual sacrifices for the common good. That patience is a virtue and that health and equity for everyone is important and that there is no limit to love and compassion and dignity. We just have to open our hearts. Now, I don't claim to have all the answers and you should really be wary of anyone who tells you that they do. All I have are my experiences and what I learned from them. And if that helps you avoid something while embracing others, then so be it. I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. That's up to you. I can only give you what I believe to be true. But ultimately, it's up to you to decide how you want to live. But here are a couple of things that I've learned along the way. Now, before I graduated from college in Kansas City, I was worried. I was worried that once I entered medical school that my life would be over and that I couldn't do the things that I thought were interesting. So against the wishes of my dear mother, I decided that I would take a year off from school and venture out and try and do something different. What the cool kids now call a gap year, but more precisely what my mother called a don't even think about moving back home year. So my senior year of college, I decided I was going to enroll in paramedic school. So I plotted my calendar for that year so that I took courses from my biology degree on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, which left Tuesday and Thursday open for paramedic school at the local community college, which coincidentally was when they offered it. It was almost as if God wanted me to do this. I did my clinical rotations on the weekends, and at the end of the day, I was taking 30 hours of courses each semester my senior year. Now, of course, since I was going to two different schools, nobody knew anything different. Nobody could tell me no. Now, I don't recommend this to everybody. I was exhausted. I didn't have a lot of free time. My diet mostly consisted of peanut butter sandwiches. In many ways, it was like working during a pandemic, minus the peanut butter, but I loved it. I loved the challenge of it. I loved that I was doing something that I wanted to do. And that if I was going to fail, then I would do it on my terms. The first step in a unique journey and a hallmark of lifetime of decisions to come. And I went on to be a paramedic and it was this amazing experience. I could not believe that people paid me to do this job. And little did I know, but I was also learning, learning about what we now call the social determinants of health, long before it became a buzz phrase. I learned about this by taking care of people where they lived and worked and played. In fact, the very definition from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention states social determinants of health are conditions in the places where people learn and work and live and play that affect the wide range of health and quality of life risks and outcomes. I took care of kids with chickenpox, yes, People will call 911 for a rash, but you see it was not because they didn't know that 911 wasn't for emergencies. It was because we had built a place where only healthcare that somebody knows or has access to is through emergency medical services, a society that failed to fund healthcare for the most vulnerable among us. Even when the governed voted to change the very constitution of the state that makes it so, and at the ripe old age of 22 years old, during my gap year, I pronounced another innocent child dead from a gunshot wound. A stray bullet that found her while she slept on the couch 
in the front room of her home. Seared into my mind were the grief of the family and the entire community that had gathered outside of her home. These were things that most medical professionals nor most of the population would ever see or experience. Now, some of you would complain about a mother coming to an emergency department by ambulance for a rash, but missing the point that 911 was dialed by society long ago. It just caught up to us on this night, and it continues to catch up to us on the streets of St. Louis and Minneapolis and across the country until we come to grips with what sort of society do we want to live in. You see, that child with the rash lived in squalid conditions in a cramped apartment using a stove for heat, no food in the refrigerator. Social determinants, conditions in the places where people live, learn, work, and play that affect a wide range of outcomes. Now, just as I had signed up for that paramedic course in college, I thought this sounds interesting when I joined the U.S. Army Reserves, my second year of residency in emergency medicine. And just to take it one step further, I transferred from a hospital unit to a civil affairs unit, a branch at least then of the United States Special Operations Command. Now, civil affairs is the sort of nation building arm of the military, as we described ourselves, NGOs with guns. Now, I was a public health team chief for the 418th Civil Affairs Battalion out of Belton, Missouri. And in December 2002, I was married and had two young boys. My oldest was 16 months. My youngest was four months at the time. My wife was in law school, and I had just finished my master's degree in public health right here at St. Louis University. And it was then that I got a strange call from my company commander. Three weeks later, I was sleeping in World War II era barracks in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, together with hundreds of other soldiers preparing to deploy to war. Six weeks after that, I was sleeping in the back of a Humvee in the middle of the Kuwaiti desert, waiting to go over the berm with 125 degree heat during the day and keeping my sleeping bag completely zipped up at night to protect me from the sandstorm that always decided to thrash us at zero dark 30. I eventually, I laid my head down in the worst camp cot you can ever imagine in an operating room in a hospital on Saddam's palace grounds in Tikrit, Iraq. This would become my home for a year. My friend, Captain Ed Lupomik, a hulking JAG officer who looked like a superhero with a square jaw and bulging biceps would come up to me and say, well, doc, could be worse. We could be in Iraq. Only to quickly look around and say, wait a minute, we are in Iraq, it can't get any worse. And then he would let out this huge laugh. Embrace the suck, we would say. I was told, go out and rebuild healthcare for three provinces. Great, I said, where do I start? Figure it out, Captain. I was suddenly gripped with this enormity of this challenge. Where do I start? I don't even know this place. I don't know the people. I don't know the language. What do you mean, figure it out? So I gathered my team, and we went down to the local hospital, the Saddam Hospital in Tikrit. We entered the doors into the main hall. The lights were off because of a missile strike. To the building next door that, to the hospital that housed Saddam's secret police, and only the emergency lights were on, powered by a generator. A janitor was busy cleaning up when he noted these four men, decked out in what we call battle rattle, Kevlar vests with sappy plates, helmets, sunglasses, and assault weapons. He motioned us to come down, down a hallway that took us to a small office where inside sat two doctors. And it was right there that I met some of the kindest souls that I have ever known. Dr. Bashar al-Demi, an ophthalmologist, and Dr. Saad al-Rawi, a forensic pathologist. They stood up, surprised but almost excited, and said, Salam Alaikum. The traditional greeting in a Muslim country meaning peace be with you. Now I like that. They touched their hands to their hearts, they invited us to sit down, and they had a servant fetch us some tea. I got out my notebook to take some notes, and they told me, in the Arabic tradition you must first talk about family and life for the first 15 minutes before you talk business. First lesson learned. 
Eventually, I got around to asking my questions, what do you need? They looked at me and said, glass. And I looked at them puzzled, and they looked at me like I was an idiot. Your bombs, they said. They blew out all of our windows. And they said it in such a way as if I was personally flying the plane that dropped the ordinance. Summer is coming, they said. We need glass, we need electricity to cool the hospital. There will be a lot of sick people. And it was at this moment that I realized that my four years of medical school, my three years of training in emergency medicine, my two years working on a master's degree at public health were reduced to glass and electricity. A lesson in social determinants. Other things influence health, not the other way around. We know where you, we can get the glass if you can get it for us. Great, I said, where is it? At the Ministry of Education, they replied. Why there? I asked quizzically. Because they thought you were going to bomb the schools, they replied with a slight grin. Again, I was not flying the planes. I don't make the bombing sorties. And why the heck would we bomb a school? Just write a letter, they said. Why? I asked. If you write a letter, they will do it. That's how it's done here. So lesson number two. I soon learned no one did anything without a letter. They would not take down a picture of Saddam from their office without a letter. After all, we hadn't caught him at that time. He may come back, but if they had a letter, well, then. So I left. I went back to my headquarters. I found the guys in our battalion that were working with the schools, and I convinced them that we needed to donate the glass to the hospital. It didn't take much persuading for the Ministry of Education to donate glass, because after all, I had written a letter. I even borrowed Captain Ed's crimping device that he had used to notarize legal documents. And of course, this had absolutely nothing to do with the letter at all, but it made it look really official. And if they needed a letter, by God, they were getting a letter. And I was right. The education administrator ran his fingers along the embossing, surely thinking to himself, this, this letter must have come from President Bush or even Don Rumsfeld. Now, within a day, I had a crew of Army soldiers carrying huge panes of glass into the hospital. And I had the hospital hire a glass installer, which I paid for because, after all, apparently I blew them all out. And we got the electricity rerouted. And within a week, I was standing in the intensive care unit. The lights were on and the air was cooled. And I took a picture of two Iraqi teenagers sitting on a bed, smiling. Now, over the course of that year, these physicians and many others became my friends. I met their families. They gave me gifts on Ramadan. I gave them gifts for Christmas. Dr. Saad became my confidant and would risk his safety and his security to help me whenever I needed it. And perhaps he did this because he knew enough to be nice to the people that had power, but I don't think so. And I cried when I left him the last time, knowing that I would never see him again and unsure what his future would be. Now we kept in touch for a while through his son, but with spotty internet and even worse security, we lost touch long ago. I think about him often, and sometimes I dream about him and his colleagues, and I remain amazed at the kind of people they were. We think we have a bad day when the car battery dies, or we didn't accomplish our key performance indicator on patient satisfaction, or when somebody asks us to wear a mask on a plane. These people came to work during a freaking war. They faced down terrorists who brought their wounded to the hospital and kept the hospital running without pay, without electricity. So here is what I've learned from these experiences. You've heard me say that life is not fair, and that is true. It is not. However, I learned that fairness can be random and it can be planned. And in drawing an analogy from my public health friends, the way to make a study more resemble the truth, you must remove the bias and only allow the randomness which you cannot prevent to occur. So a shout out to my public health friends there. So work to make it fair for everyone, for those who are not given a fair shake, for those who are unfairly treated through no fault of their own, and for those that are unfairly oppressed, remove the bias so that our society better reflects the truth, truths that are self-evident, 
that all men and women are created equal. I learned that sometimes you need to make a crazy action if what you are doing is important to you. And if it is important to you, you will find a way to make it work and it will not feel like work because it is something that motivates you. It's something that you feel that is exactly what you are meant to be doing in exactly the right time in exactly the right place. And it shows you that you can do what you thought was seemingly impossible. I can't say don't be afraid. Yes, you will be afraid, but embrace it and make it your own, not somebody else's. So take some crazy chances. You will be amazed at how much you can do if you just take the chance. The body is strong, but the mind is weak. Make the mind strong as well. I learned that when faced with what appears to be insurmountable problems, problems so big like tackling a pandemic or rebuilding a war-torn country, problems so big that they just leave you paralyzed because of the magnitude, just start. Just do one thing, fix a window. It seems so simple, but it is also so true. Just do something and it will come to you. It will become more clear. Just start. I learned that experiences matter. They shape you, they teach you, they will humble you. They will make life so, so very much worth living but make sure they are experiences worth having. That at the end of the day, you go to bed content and usually exhausted. Choose those experiences that make the world a better place. For I firmly believe that the only reason for our existence on this earth is to make us better, to make the world better for our fellow brothers and sisters who share our world. Otherwise, why are we here? So whether it's fighting injustice, working for the poor, raising your children to be good people, or simply picking up the trash, make the world better. Everything else is just an illusion of what others want you to believe has value. It will not make you whole. It will not give you peace. It will not give you the courage to do the right things at the right time for the right reason. And it compounds over time. My experiences as a paramedic made me a better physician because I understood what my patients were going through. Even if I did not live their lives, I had lived in theirs for brief periods of time. And that has much value as the skill of a surgeon. And I'm hoping that I made their lives a little bit better. My experiences as a soldier made me a better person because I understood that most people, regardless of nationality, regardless of the religion, really only want what we all want, to live in peace, to raise a family, to practice a faith, and to be given a chance to live. And I hope that I helped to make their lives better for at least the short period of time that they allowed me into theirs. All of these experiences helped me during the pandemic to be an advocate for those who labor day in and day out, to be a voice when there was a lot of chatter, to not be afraid because I had seen worse. I had lived in more hostile environments. If the worst anybody can do is call me a name, you don't understand me. You don't understand where I've been, you don't understand what I've seen, and you don't understand what I've done. And lastly, I've learned how incredibly lucky I am and that things can always be worse. Yes, even when Big Ed said, holy crap, we're in Iraq and it can't get any worse, we both knew it could definitely be much worse. And at the end of our tour, we were gonna go home to the land of the Big PX People would buy us drinks, call us heroes. I tell people I did nothing heroic. I just had to keep from dying on any given day. The rest was really gravy. But Dr. Saad would still be there in Iraq, trying to survive. He was my hero. The doctors and nurses and public health workers and those who took the slings and arrows to defend actions that saved lives during the pandemic, they're my heroes. And those that labor for social justice they are my heroes. You, the graduating class of 2021, are also incredibly lucky. You have families that have raised you right, protected you, paid astronomical amounts of money to receive the very best education. And you are also my future heroes. 
You have been through a lot over the past four years. You have strived, you have endured, and you have undoubtedly suffered. And now you have one other thing. You have experience and understanding, and you will be there when the next pandemic or other complex, hairy, insurmountable, worldwide problem comes along, and you will say, when they ask, who shall we send? And you will say, here I am, send me. I have no doubt that you will be bold, that you will thirst to understand, that you will have compassion, and that you will use what you have learned here at St. Louis University to seek out those experiences that make you and the world a better place and live out that phrase, higher purpose, greater good. Now go and change the world. Go in peace and Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Garza. I welcome back Mr. Conran to introduce the honorary degree recipients. President Pestello, I have the honor to inform you that the Board of Trustees, by virtue of the right granted to it by the State of Missouri, has voted to authorize you to confer upon these persons honorary degrees in recognition of their singular achievements. Dr. Alexander Garza, Mr. and Dr. Larry and Brenda Thompson, and Mr. and Mrs. Allen and Linda Vogt. Dr. Alexander Garza is the Chief Community Health Officer at SSM Health and is responsible for deepening the focus on social determinants of health, equity, and social justice, as well as supporting transition to population health. In this position, Dr. Garza works with local, regional, and national organizations, advocating to improve the lives of the community, leading to healthier outcomes overall. Dr. Garza has decades of experience in public health and safety and policy development. He has originated and led SSM Health's overall response to the COVID-19 pandemic and oversees the region's coordinated response efforts as incident commander for the St. Louis Metropolitan Pandemic Task Force. Dr. Garza became SSM's Chief Community Health Officer in August 2020, after serving as Chief Medical Officer since 2018, overseeing quality patient safety, clinical ana analytics. And prior to this role, he served as SSM Health's Chief Quality Officer, as well as Chief Medical Officer for the St. Louis region. Board certified in emergency medicine, Dr. Garza has over 13 years practicing and teaching in higher education. Before joining SSM Health, he was Associate Dean and Professor at the St. Louis University College of Public Health and Social Justice. He has published numerous scientific papers on original research in peer-reviewed journals and lectured nationally and internationally. He was awarded the Young Investigator Award by the American Heart Association for his research on cardiac arrest. Prior to moving back home to St. Louis, Dr. Garza was appointed by President Barack Obama and confirmed by the United States Senate as the Assistant Secretary for Health Affairs and Chief Medical Officer for the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, where he served from 2009 through 2013. Dr. Garza led the health and security efforts for the Department of Homeland Security, including the health aspects of terrorism and natural disasters, including the H1N1 pandemic, the Haitian earthquake, and the Fukushima nuclear disaster. He played a critical role in protecting the United States from threats of terrorism. Dr. Garza is also a colonel with over 20 years of service in the United States Army Reserves. He is a veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom and serves as the command surgeon 
for the 352nd Civil Affairs Command. He has received numerous awards for his service, including the Bronze Star and the Combat Action Badge. For his deep commitment to leading both his country and his city during uncertain times, and for his work to improve the health of the community, the degree of Doctor of Public Service, Honoris Causa, will be conferred upon Alexander Garza. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of St. Louis University, I hereby confer upon Dr. Alexander Garza the degree of Doctor of Public Service and declare his name will be inscribed forever on the university's roll call of honorary graduates. As a young couple in the 1970s, Brenda and Larry Thompson moved from Michigan to Larry's native Missouri so he could start his first job out of law school in St. Louis. Once there, Brenda earned her doctorate in clinical psychology from St. Louis University in 1980. The Thompsons extended that support back to St. Louis University and its students. As noted collectors of art by African-American artists, the couple established the Larry and Brenda Thompson Graduate Scholarship to support English, American Studies, or history students who have an interest in art by African-American artists and volunteer at the St. Louis University Museum of Art. In 2014, St. Louis University's museum exhibited Tradition Redefined, the Larry and Brenda Thompson collection of African-American art. The Thompson's efforts are renowned in the art world. In 2012, they generously donated a collection of 100 works of art celebrating the African-American culture and experience to the Georgia Museum of Art. Since then, the couple has also funded an endowment to support the curatorial position, which focuses on African-American and African dysphoric art. Brenda's professional career focused on child and adolescent mental health. She retired as a clinical psychologist from the Atlanta Public Schools. She also served as a member of the Board of Trustees at two major art institutions, the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia and the Bruce Museum in Greenwich, Connecticut. Larry, a native of Hannibal, Missouri, is the son of a railroad laborer. He received his bachelor's degree cum laude from Culver Stockton College in 1967 and earned his master's degree at Michigan State University in 1969. In 1974, he completed his law degree at the University of Michigan. For their commitment to St. Louis University and their dedication to collecting, sharing, and preserving African American works of art, the degree of Doctor of Arts Honoris Causa will be conferred upon Larry and Brenda Thompson. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of St. Louis University, I hereby confer upon Mr. and Dr. Larry and Brenda Thompson the degree of Doctor of Arts and declare that their names will be inscribed forever on the university's roll of honorary graduates. Even a casual fan of Billiken basketball might recognize Linda and Alan Vogt. They have been a permanent fixture at games, both home and away, for years standing at center court and cheering themselves hoarse. Their broader dedication to the student athletes they came to support, however, is less well recognized, which is how they seem to prefer it. Linda describes she and her husband as just average people who want to see others succeed. They have helped slew student athletes by supporting their academic efforts, nutrition programs, and campus life activities. Their commitment to these initiatives has created a deeper connection for all SLU students 
to the Billiken sports programs across campus. Their passion for athletics is longstanding, but their greater interest and impact has been assisting student athletes in maximizing their potential after graduation. This commitment to life after college for so many Billikens has been their ongoing focus. Along the way, they have helped thousands of SLU students change their lives. A native of Charleston, Missouri, Linda attended Miller Hawkins Business College in Memphis, Tennessee. Allen, a lifelong St. Louisan, is a 1969 graduate of the St. Louis University Richard A. Chaffetz School of Business. They have been married for more than 47 years. In addition to their involvement with St. Louis University, the votes are also actively committed to the Lutheran Elementary School Association, Long Meadow Rescue Ranch of the Humane Society of Missouri, the Police Athletic League, and Unity Lutheran School in East St. Louis. For their active and deep commitment to enriching the St. Louis University student experience and for making an extraordinary difference in what it means to be both a Billiken and a Billiken fan, the degree of Doctor of Commerce, Honoris Causa, will be conferred upon Allen and Linda Vogt. By the authority vested in me, by the Board of Trustees of St. Louis University, I hereby confer upon Mr. and Mrs. Allen and Linda Vogt the degree of Doctor of Commerce and declare that their names will be inscribed forever on the university's role of honorary graduates. We now come to the highlight of the program, the multiple conferring of degrees. There is a two-part procedure in the conferral ceremony. First, the candidates for degrees will be presented by the respective deans of the colleges and schools of the university. Then, the president will confer the degrees. We will begin with the College of Arts and Sciences. The candidates from the other schools will be presented chronologically in the order in which their school or college was established at SLU. Dean Lavoie. President Pastello, on behalf of the faculty of the College of Arts and Sciences, I have the honor to present these candidates for the degrees for which they have been recommended. Dean Lavoie, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of St. Louis University, I hereby confer upon those whose names were presented the degrees for which they were nominated, and I further declare them sons and daughters of St. Louis University forever. President Pistello, on behalf of the faculty of the School of Medicine, I have the honor to present these candidates for the degrees for which they have been recommended. Dean Jacobs, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of St. Louis University, I hereby confer upon those whose names were presented the degrees for which they were nominated, and I further declare them sons and daughters of St. Louis University forever. Mr. President, on behalf of the faculty of the School of Law, I have the tremendous honor to present these candidates for the degrees for which they have been recommended. Dean Johnson, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of St. Louis University, I hereby confer upon those whose names were presented the degrees for which they were nominated, and I further declare them sons and daughters of St. Louis University forever. President Pastello, on behalf of the faculty of the College of Philosophy and Letters, I have the honor to present these candidates for the degrees for which they have been recommended. Dean Rosenberg, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of St. Louis University, I hereby confer upon those whose names were presented the degrees for which they were nominated, and I further declare them sons of St. Louis University forever. Preston Pistello, on behalf of the faculty, 
of the Richard A. Chaffetz School of Business. I have the honor to present these candidates for the degrees for which they have been recommended. Dean Gupta, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of St. Louis University, I hereby confer upon those whose names were presented the degrees for which they were nominated, and I further declare them sons and daughters of St. Louis University forever. President Pastello, on behalf of the Faculty of Parks College of Engineering, Aviation and Technology, I have the honor to present these candidates for the degrees for which they have been recommended. Dean Doolman, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of St. Louis University, I hereby confer upon those whose names were presented the degrees for which they were nominated, and I further declare them sons and daughters of St. Louis University forever. President Pastello, on behalf of the faculty of the School of Nursing, I have the honor to present these candidates for the degrees for which they have been recommended. Dean Willis, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of St. Louis University, I hereby confer upon those whose names were presented the degrees for which they were nominated, and I further declare them sons and daughters of St. Louis University forever. President Pistello, on behalf of the faculty of the Edward and Margaret Doisy College of Health Sciences, I have the honor to present these candidates for the degrees for which they have been recommended. Dean Austin, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of St. Louis University, I hereby confer upon those whose names were presented the degrees for which they were nominated, and I further declare them sons and daughters of St. Louis University forever. President Pastello, on behalf of the faculty of the College for Public Health and Social Justice, I have the honor to present these candidates for the degrees for which they have been recommended. Dean Burroughs, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of St. Louis University, I hereby confer upon those whose names were presented the degrees for which they were nominated, and I further declare them sons and daughters of St. Louis University forever. President Pastello, on behalf of the faculty of the School for Professional Studies, I have the honor to present these candidates for the degrees for which they have been recommended. Dean Chapman, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of St. Louis University, I hereby confer upon those whose names were presented the degrees for which they were nominated, and I further declare them sons and daughters of St. Louis University forever. President Pastello, on behalf of the faculty of the School of Education, I have the honor to present these candidates for the degrees for which they have been recommended. Dean Ritter, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of St. Louis University, I hereby confer upon those whose names were presented the degrees for which they were nominated, and I further declare them sons and daughters of St. Louis University forever. President Pastello, on behalf of the faculty of the Centers of St. Louis University, I have the honor to present these candidates for the degrees for which they have been recommended. Dean Burroughs, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of St. Louis University, I hereby confer upon those whose names were presented the degrees for which they were nominated, and I further declare them sons and daughters of St. Louis University forever. Let us congratulate our class of 2021 graduates. I now invite Rabbi Susan Talvey to confer a blessing upon us. Psalm 1 begins with the Hebrew word ashrei. Ashrei usually translated as happy, as in happy as the person who does not follow the counsel of the wicked or take the path of sinners. But the deeper meaning is not happy. 
it is forward, forward and upward. Forward travels the person who reaches with every step. Forward is the one who pays attention and ascends. Forward is the one who chooses with care and compassion and kindness. A sacred journey, knowing that each step forward has the power to hurt or to heal. This graduating class has had to invent new ways to go forward. I asked about you and I was told that you modeled and inspired how to walk forward in holy ways for those who followed and you kept each other safe and continued to learn. How I would love to see your faces and look into your eyes. I imagine you surrounded by your teachers and friends and families and I hope you feel me telling you how we believe in you. We love you, how you give us hope, and that we need you to continue to walk the holy walk as you go forward in the next chapters of your lives. To go forward and know that there are no shortcuts. To stay safe and smart, you have to do the work and not cut corners. To go forward and know that you will need to be creative as you respond to the unexpected and unplanned, to go forward and remember that with each step, how you do is as important as what you do. There is a tradition that says that at any one time, there needs to be 36 righteous individuals upon whose merit the world continues to exist. We don't know who they are, and they are usually so humble, they don't even know who they are. But they receive blessings and so are able to be a blessing. The tradition probably reaches back to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah when Abraham tried to bargain with God to save the cities that were overrun with greed and selfishness with no concern for the common good. Abraham, you remember, bargained God down to 10 righteous whose merit would save all the others. But in the end, there were not even 10 and the cities could not survive. So here is my prayer as you go forward, as we give you our blessing. Use everything you have ever learned and let it flow through you down to your feet so that you will walk in the world with holiness and healing and be one of the 10. Be one of the 10 regardless of what others are doing around you. Be one of the 10 and know that you are not alone. Be one of the 10 and I promise you, no matter how broken we are or the world is, we will be many on this path, on this holy path, seeking justice, showing mercy and kindness with every step. And you will go forward. And one day, the good in us will win. And not only will we be giving you blessings to keep you safe, to give you peace, but you will be the blessing. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Talvi. In the academic tradition, we are nearing the end of our commencement exercises. To the class of 2021, while this day marks the end of your time as a student, it is the beginning of your lifelong connection as an alumna or alumnus of St. Louis University. Your alumni family is composed of more than 120,000 mission-driven and successful alumni living around the world. And wherever your life's journey takes you, there will be opportunities to remain connected to your St. Louis University family. We hope that here you have met the people who will celebrate future endeavors with you. SLU is still your home and you will always be welcome on campus. And now, a final word from Dr. Pastello. As we close our ceremonies, it is my great pleasure to say congratulations, graduates. Although we are not together in person, I encourage each of you to yell the word forever when I point to you. You are now members of the Billiken family forever.